All right, so um, we were talking about Sorten, and uh, you had asked me something about some some uh, fingerings in there about the you know the different right hand possibilities of that, and um, yeah, he has A I was it A I M I M. Is that what you? Do? That's what Can I was starting to do, and and I was coming up with other options through reading Sword's method and just kind of understanding his view of it, and then just trying to see if there was other fingerings that might also be speedy and efficient that aren't printed here, and that might correlate with other parts of the score. Where oh yeah, because we were talking about these. Uh, those places, yeah, the places where the where the, um, the places where the chords, oh, right, that and um, there's this kind of nasty places that start happening over here. That stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what's in what's in what's in the sore? Does it does he is it a lot of pi or a, a lot of pi? A lot of pi. Um, I know Segovia has that A I M I M. I do A M I M I. That's always felt uh, more comfortable to me. Okay. I mean, I, I think I can do the other, but how would that change here? Well, that's what we, we started talking about yesterday, that yesterday. And uh, what I do, you said you did P M A, and then P M A I. What'd you say again? PMA? PMA? I M I. I M I. PMA to end. So PMA on both the start and the end. That's good. I mean, that works good. I do P I M A M I. And then, of course, the P I is there. Mm -hmm. So it's P I M on the last chord also. Yeah. Just trying to figure out a way, you know, these these those um, those parts in there were problematic for me too, and I was trying to figure out a way to, uh, you know, to make it make sense for myself. And by making the chords PIMs, and then having the AMI for the for those single notes, it seemed to make uh, uh, make. Okay. Um, and then it worked for all. It works for all of those that come. These. I do P I M A M I A M I M. So it's it fits all of those those places. Okay. What were what were you doing in that? Um, what were you doing in those? Your same thing, P M A. I yeah, I, I tend to favor P M A, P -M -A for chord. some reason. That just feels good to my hand, and I like the sound quality that I can get. And it tends to favor a little bit of sheer technique in terms of the the, the index finger reaching over. But. Hmm. And then I am I, right? Okay. Um, so essentially, the except for this particular spot where it ends on the chord, this pattern of A I M I is followed throughout. Oh, and you can even say that P M A. Is like starting a, with the A, right? Right. So it's uh, consistent in that way. So in terms of uh, learning how to play this quickly, um, would it be advisable to practice the burst by itself and make it reactionary, and then turn the piece itself into uh, more of a block chording? Etc. 
etc where the mapping out of the left hand is done and then the right hand is done separately and then to piece it together that that that's been best for me and I, I just wanted to know if there there is a better uh, way of getting to the point of, of realizing how to play it but faster well that seems that seems like a good way to uh, learn the chords on the left hand and how do you practice the the, the repeated notes well when I play it mapped out I just play a M chord so I'm actually playing the notes with the appropriate fingers for the burst and then when I practice the burst I'm actually just and playing it very staccato and then also just um, very free and combining those two concepts with speed yeah, I think I think that's good to do I mean that's stuff we talk about about preparing you know doing the staccato preparations to help you with your uh, quickness just getting the next finger right to the string as you know quickly as you can and um, doing that slowly at, at first and and uh, just developing it a little faster uh, gradually using your metronome to do it um, you could even use your metronome you know you could use it on single notes and you could use it uh, how do you how do you use it do you use it when you when you do this oh absolutely um, I usually use basically a model of Scott Tennant's book of going slow repeatedly maybe three to seven times in a row depending on how many times I need to practice it slowly and then either the fourth beat or the eighth beat respectively depending on how many times I'm doing it slowly I'll double the tempo so I'll basically do it three times slow on, on the fourth beat I'll do it twice as fast so that I'm still staying within the metronome and just testing twice as fast if it doesn't feel comfortable yet I usually take more time doing it slowly and um, be a little bit more patient with myself in terms of uh, not trying to go as fast as soon but I don't know if, if that is... No, it's good. Okay. And that makes sense. But if I... So what speed would we put this on and you could... We could try that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, oh. we, we, could, uh, we could try... Let's try... Show, show me what you do. 96? Whatever. Okay, that's fine. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't... Let's see how that... Let's see how that... So... Uh, what you can do first. Exactly. To really get it. And then after that. Exactly. Should the basses ring? Should they ring uh -huh. right up until the new burst, or short and detached? I do that. It could be that. I don't do that. Okay. I stop them. I'm not letting it ring. There. Mm -hmm. I'm stopping it. What do you think? I think that um, it sounds good either way. Most recordings I've heard, 
usually stop it like that, but it's this, not really indicated that way, is it? It isn't. Yeah. Well, it keeps it cleaner, and you know, certainly in these uh, chord places. Uh, it gets hard to, if you're going to just let this ring, or you can let the ring. Certainly when you move your hand to the next place, it stops them. So there's, it's a little hard to keep uh, complete consistency, I think, with that. Would you suggest... Mixing the two concepts? I think, I think it happens sometimes. Because certain, certain, some of these open strings take a little more uh, care and different ways to stop them. Okay. Sometimes with the left hand you have to do some damping also. Can we talk about the development of speed with uh, the Lobos Etude 1? Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of the same types of concepts of planting quickly, um, I, noticed, I just noticed you you put your thumb. Did you do that? Do you do that all the time? Not when I'm playing the piece, but usually I do when I'm reminding myself of. Where the, the fingers are going in a planting sense, it just helps keep things, I think, a little more stable for me. But then again, oh. that's not what I'm doing when I'm performing, so maybe I shouldn't be doing that. I think I'd recommend maybe not do that. Okay. But, you, know, you know, especially because you don't do it when you really, especially because you Okay. Meaning that it's always preparing also, especially in the descending moments. I think ascending you always do, are doing it right. But here, Passage. Yeah, sure. The descending slurs. Yeah. I do this. I 
do this one. I do that the same. Hmm. But, uh, I, you know, I see people do different things there, and I, I've certainly seen that. And if it works for you, I mean, I wouldn't tell you not to do it. Okay. But, um, I, you know, I don't... This always seemed to me... When you get your th third finger here to, to make sense, and also because the right hand part of it is this, is the same, you know? You've done like a page and a half of this arpeggio, so that this m movement is really similar to what's been going on. I think in what you're doing, could you do yours? It does oh, change it. It changes it. It does seem to set your fingers up well for this next part. Yes. But that would, that would be the thing to me that I would I would think about is the sameness of this uh, that movement. But yours is also nice because it doesn't. There's no squeak in it. There's no That's squeak. Nice, plus it. The, That's a nice thing. I like what you've said. I've I've tried that method before, and the the part that I really didn't like. The, the most is the jump. Yeah. And to me, the, it, it with this one passage being the only part that's different in the entire etude, yeah. it seems to almost have a musical direction, for me anyway, of heading towards that. That's the mm. climax of the whole piece. You know, I think, though, you know, with practice, you, get, you can get from that okay. to that. I mean, but... I certainly understand what you're talking about. Um, so how do you uh, how do we work on speeding this up using our trusty device over here? I usually hit it at 152, and I put eighth notes to this. Really planting. Just start like first thing, just like that. Because I would do that. Like first thing, first thing in the day, or first time you work on this. I would do it real slow. Okay. Just to get really a good feeling, really settled. that a few minutes, minutes of that then I'll actually apply the chords and then I'll start at 108 for 16th notes you go right from that to one into to 108 that? and then start bumping it up two notches at a time That's a big jump. 
you know, to go from like the 152 at eighth notes and then uh, putting it at 108 to the quarter, right? Right. Yeah. So, uh, but you just just jump like that, you know? After you know, I've done 152 for let's go back to that for seven, eight minutes in a row, something like that. It, it seems to be fairly comfortable to jump to 108. intermediary stops along the way. You know, it's been jumping so far. Yeah. And somebody who was, you know, you're pretty advanced with this. I mean, somebody who was really developing this, uh, I would just go one one click at a time to, to you know, get it really solid and really worked in there. Okay. I mean, you're you know, you're past that, but uh, that you know is a better is a good way to develop it when you're really you know at that developing point. Okay. Um, so okay, so here we are. This speed. Still really focusing on preparation. of the arpeggio, you know. been able to play it at 132 recently That's which right. is is good. pretty much my target tempo but it usually requires um, 30 minutes or so of walking up the metronomic ladder Let's see what we, let's see what looks like.
prepare. I try to keep that sense of connection to the strings and, and one finger pushing the next finger into the string. And it does get to a point at 132 where I'm starting to lose that, but I know that it's somewhat built in, otherwise I wouldn't be able to play it at 132. But it doesn't feel quite as extra prepared mm -hmm. as even 108. Okay. But it's just all in the process, I guess, of... You're doing good with it, you know? To It's all the same uh, concepts coming together of developing quickness of one finger playing and the next finger preparing or going to the string or just reacting at the same speed as the as the finger that's plucking. You just keep trying to work on, on making that happen quicker. I mean, whether it's in, in, in something like this, where you play slowly but move really quickly. I mean, that's the whole, the whole thing. Playing slowly but moving really quickly. Because that's what makes you quicker. The same in the right hand or the or the left hand. I mean, if we're we're doing uh, this study sometimes, and we talk about how to get quicker shifts. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. We're we'll playing slowly, but shifting quicker than we than we need to do. technique like if you were trying for trying to develop uh, connectedness would be to shift later or more in time with the right hand Opposite, but they work together to. to it's almost to like the two meet playing. at the intersection of speed. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah, it's, I think that's true. But you know, you can actually practice both things, and and really, if a person had one kind of problem, you might do one. You know, one way of doing it. If you had a different kind of problem, you might do the other. So, if you're trying to really increase your quickness, you're going to play slow and do that really fast shifting thing hmm. but if you're if you have trouble connecting you play slowly and, and work on connecting your hands instead of doing that extra fast hmm. shifting I mean that's what I would I would tell you to do um, you know you've you've done really well with you do really well with all these and you've reached you know good points and you know you know the progress thing is like you're going up really quickly and easily for a while and then you hit some speeds where you sort of level off and then you, you work at those speeds for a while, blah, 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 and then you get a little better. And you know, It just takes much more time to make those increases. Uh, and that's the way it is. And um, you just have to keep applying these techniques and, and uh, doing it to 
to get that to improve you even more. Hmm. You know, I mean, you know, you like in A two in below A two one when you're you know you know you're like up to one thirty two uh, to get to. Well, the great thing with the digital metronome is just you can you can inch your way up there. You know, with your metronome, you're going in in a one thirty two to one thirty eight is a six number jump, which is hard to. That's hard to. That's that's a lot, you know. But doing it this way, one thirty two to one thirty three, you can trick yourself into into you know speeding up. Uh, such 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 a subtle gradient, you know, that you can you can do that. Do you, hmm. do, you do that? Do you have? A, I don't a have one. one. I don't. I I have the good old fashioned, oh, and I even have even more old fashioned with the wooden one. <laughs> I have in here somewhere. I have a, I have an electric metronome. Hmm. An old Seth Thomas electric. The big the black big one. Box. Yes. No, mine was that big wooden <laughs> one, but yeah. But uh, so you know maybe you need to, to think about that. Yeah. I mean you have a lot of great equipment. You could invest in a digital <laughs> metronome to, uh, to go along with it because I think that would really help you. Like let like you know let's say we're, we're doing this. Let's just go back to that for a second. This so one? A two one. Okay. So we just went there. That's something you should you should do. It doesn't have to cost you much money to do that either. Mm. You know, not these days. Mm -hmm. And you can get a digital metronome for not not that much money. Um, can I ask you about the 132? It, that seems to be a very good solid tempo to perform at. How much further than that would you suggest pushing it uh, to not be so close to the edge? when performing? You know, I haven't listened to... Have you listened to any, re any recordings and timed them? I've listened to Norbert Kraft and I've listened I've to listened, 132. Oh, 132. And um, Barwaco is right around 138. Okay. Um, you know, from the point of view of practicing it as a study, I mean, you could, you know, try to go on as far as you could you know there's that uh, people talk about um, developing a reserve of speed so like you could get past that to make it easier to come back to 138 you know so that when you play at 138 it, it sounds easy and, and feels easy for you well if it feels easy maybe it'll sound easy but um, and I mean there's a, that makes sense you know if you could play like if you could play it at 144, that but when you perform it, you played it at 138. You know, of course, it would be comfortable. But something I always wonder about is, um, you know, if you get nervous and you speed up, which is what tends to happen, does that mean that you're gonna now you're gonna play at 144 because that's as fast as you can play? So I mean, so you're always finding this precipice anyway. You know, it's kind of a funny thing. But I, I, I mean, I think that that. Uh, reserve thing makes sense as long as you can control yourself you know you keep, so you're not the point is you're not playing at the limit all the time because you're playing at the limit you you know you could mm -hmm. that could happen mm -hmm. so um, same is true with the uh, tremolo pieces uh, you know where we talk about sort of acceptable tremolo speeds for, mm -hmm. for performance uh, um, so what do we think that is? Have you said 132, 144, somewhere in there? I, I guess I would think 138 to, you know, beyond to 160, or even some people up at 168 for their tremolo. And, you know, even in really good performances of 
tremolo pieces, you know, the flexibility of the of the pulse uh, manipulates from can manipulate from 138 to 160 uh, just from someone who's really sensitive to the music and, and the flexibility of that and the, and the flow. Can we talk about the um, the use of this metronome and the speed concepts as applied to tremolo in, in yeah. more detail? Um, sure. Uh, Certainly, you know, again, we can always start with one note per click. in a you know, quicker way, but I mean, if a person was really learning to do this for the first time, I mean, I would tell you to go just much smaller mm -hmm. increments. Mm -hmm. But, so here we are here, doing the same thing. here.
four eight notes. So we're really just going normally like 125. Right. This helps with the rhythmic this, I precision. I think this helps with the rhythmic precision and the gradual development of it. We go back, we divide it in half again, and we have quarter notes. the fingers between each stroke, is that what you meant? With preparing them or without preparing them? Um, I want a prepared sound, but I want to not sit on the string very much. I want to have a sense of legato while I'm practicing it, but still keep a prepared sound. Because you could, um, you could prepare and still relax each finger, certainly slowly enough, between each stroke, which can really help you loosen up your hand, keep your hand loose, and then increase your speed that way, and eventually it becomes more of a... you're saying to not prepare and just do a more continuous stroke relaxing each finger as Again, opposed to making more of a of a distinct uh, pattern mm -hmm. of it I mean there's you know more than one way that that I think works and if you I think actually if you practice some of these different systems and Put them on, you know. They they they're all trying to get to the same place, mm -hmm. and they just sort of do it in different ways. I think it, but at some point they they actually converge. You know what I mean? I mean, if you're doing that, relaxing each finger, let's say, and then if you're not doing that, let's say you're doing something where they all go in and then go out with the thumb. Eventually, we all have to start making that circle. So it all sort of leads to the same sort of how you get there. And uh, I think whichever way works better for you to get there is what, what you should do. So um, that's very good. Nice playing. Thanks, Bruce. Terrific.